Uh, today for our session, the top 10 objections to digitalization, a panel discussion to help bring your team on the journey with you to digital transformation. All right, let's jump in and introduce our, uh, our panelists. Uh, so first one here is Robert Perry from Delic. He has over 35 years of experience in the chemical and refining industry. Throughout his career, Robert has held many positions from procurement, cost engineer, project controls, turnaround management, uh, Robert is currently the Senior Director SME, supporting major capital and turnaround projects for Delic Refining. Thanks for joining us, Robert. Andy Woods graduated from the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow, Scotland in 1988 with a Bachelor in Science in Chemical Engineering. He has 33 years uh, in the industry with experience in plant operations, maintenance, and technical roles. He has spent 14 years with Chevron Phillips in the last in the last three years of Port Arthur as a plant manager. He currently serves on several community boards, including AFPM Maintenance and Reliability Committee. Paul Muir has uh, many years experience understanding the challenges of the current shutdown, turnaround, and outage environments and resulting requirements. As the president of North America and CRL at Mobidio, he is focused on raising awareness about the paradigm shift evolving the digitalization of the industrial workforce and driving business growth. And I will be your moderator, Daniel Goulet. I am responsible for uh, Mobidio's customer success. I've held a series of roles in my career from working in the field to executing cutting edge R&D projects, uh, managing large teams of international in engineers. As director of customer success from Mobidio, I share my industry knowledge, insights, and expertise with customers, enabling them to appreciate how digitalization and automation can fundamentally disrupt traditional SEO management and contribute to continuous improvement and planning execution of their turnarounds. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning, panelists. So as we look at this, let's see if any of these uh, if any of these sound familiar to you guys. So. My way works, don't mess with it. These are all things that people on this panel have heard before. Uh, how many times have you done my job? I can't find what I'm looking for. I'm too busy to do this. I carry too much, whether that be a tablet, a laptop, a camera, VR glasses, can be anything. I don't trust the data. <laughs> Using digital tools means I'm doing the work twice. And this is slowing me down. So what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of walk through some of these. And we're going to talk about to some of our panelists about their experience with these particular objections and um, some things that they did to, to try to overcome them. So our first one we're going to jump into is my way works. Don't mess with it. This is not how we do it. Thanks, Daniel. I, th I think on this one, you know, what I read in, into that is people kind of personalizing the situation. Uh, and when they talk about my way, you know, they're not necessarily talking about the team's way. Uh, we, hear, we hear a lot about people being resistant to change and resistant to taking a step into the unknown. But I also hear a lot about people being proud to be part of a team and, and value teamwork. So I think one of the, the things that needs to go on here is that people need to understand that they're, they're part of a team. Uh, and and as, as a leadership, we care about the individual, but we're looking, a bit, we're looking at the collective good, good. So I think set in that context, this is a really, for me, it's a leadership problem, right? If the leadership are not set in the vision and the, and the, mm -hmm. the bigger, the greater good and the greater context, then why wouldn't I be selfish? You know, why wouldn't I look at me and what the impact has on, on my day? So for me, this is a leadership problem and, and the fix is something to do with establishing the greater good and the teamwork component. So I, I would uh, definitely agree with what Paul says there. Um, this, this is definitely uh, comes from the, the comfort zone and allowing people to stay in that comfort zone and perform with mediocrity. Um, and the, the leadership have to, uh, to set the tone of why we're making this change, why we're using this new technology, 
um, what's in it for the employee um, that is going to make his life uh, easier, faster, stronger, better. Um, and you know, if, if leadership are not willing to uh, uh, to make that case for change, then you can't expect the employee to uh, to leave his comfort zone with doing the way he has always done it. So, Andy, that's great. And the way I feel about this is a lot of times we don't tell the employee how important his way is to technology. The things that they're doing and the activities they're doing, yes, it may work. But when we go to start using technology, we need that data. Mm -hmm. We need your information. We need that stuff. And we, we, we missed that opportunity to tell them your data is important when it comes to technology. Yeah, great, great point, guys. So one thing that um, I've seen a lot here and why uh, people kind of uh, fail with this one, really two things. So number one is point to the destination. So mm -hmm. a lot of people don't understand what the bigger goal to be accomplished is or that bigger goal is too ambiguous. So if we can take the time on the front end before we're trying to roll some of these things out and really try to understand what are we trying to accomplish here, right? What's, uh, what's, what's the black and white goal that we have? Because a lot of people I've encountered who say this one, uh, they just they don't understand what it means for them. Mm -hmm. And that kind of leads into a lot of, this one very often I see is, uh, is an emotional one. So this is somebody who understands that, hey, I'm a high performer. I've been doing this job for a long time. I don't think I should have to change the way I'm doing it because I lack the understanding of that black and white goal. So I think you, if you can kind of tie all of those things together, and then the last part of shaping the path is, is rallying the herd. Mm -hmm. So once you have that, uh, that, that person who is doing it well, who is bought in, who does understand what it is, pointing to that person, having that person get up and stand in front of the group and speak about mm -hmm. what this change has allowed them to do or what the thing that they're excited about the change is. Um, can, can really move the needle here. Mm -hmm. so certainly, you know, in, in our experience, um, in several of the digital tools that we've introduced into uh, uh, into our company, is that the the point to the destination is definitely the the first thing. If we don't get that right, then we're not going to follow. Uh, the others aren't going to follow. Um, the uh, using the high performer, we found very successful of the people who are, are really going to benefit at the end of the day to bring them in at the very beginning to make sure they understand you know, wh where the destination and the journey is going. Uh, and they can act um, as, as beacons for the other folks who are maybe not so keen to, uh, to, to participate in, in what we're trying to do to reach that destination. I, I would, I would uh, a couple of things I'd add to that, Andy. One would be that, you know, if we have an initiative today called Refinery of the Future 2025, for example, uh, that clearly is, is is an end goal. I think we need to look at some milestones. And mm -hmm. I would also say that it isn't that difficult to quantify some of this this stuff. I think in the early stages of the digitalization, a lot of the benefits are around productivity and you can start counting things and measuring things. So I think you can put specific targets in place along the way. Um, the other thing I would say, you talk about high performers, I think in most organizations there's a formal leadership structure, but there's also an informal leadership structure. Mm -hmm. And I think you might have, you know, a superhero in terms of performance, but you might have other personalities that people generally look to for guidance and the ambiguity point that uh, Daniel made earlier. So uh, I think getting that, that pioneering team together uh, with uh, measurable goals uh, and a clear understanding of the vision is important. All right, let's go to the next one. So just a reminder, everybody, we do have some polls up. Um, please, uh, please go and answer the polls. We're, uh, we're looking for that feedback. So we really appreciate it if you could uh, take the time and give us your input. So this next one, 
is I'm too busy and this is slowing me down. Has anybody here ever encountered this one? Uh, I have. I, th I think I think I think with this one, you know, um, again, there's again, if people are being selfish and not understanding the overall efficiency gains or benefits, mm -hmm. then they can say this is slowing me down. And maybe if you're blinkered, you think it's slowing everybody down. So I think people need to understand that the goal is as a team to move the ball up the field faster than we used to move it up the field. Um, if that means that somebody feels it a little bit slower, so that it, so the other you know teammates can move quicker collectively, I think that's that's um, <clears throat> that's important. So I guess I guess what's the remedy to that one? That, that's drawing drawing a picture not just of the vision, but of the yeah. of the overall process, so that everybody knows where they play in that process and feels that we're being a more successful team, mm -hmm. even though they might find that. Or they think they spend five minutes, you know, longer than they'd like to do on a certain task because of the, the unfamiliarity of the technology initially, for example. Mm -hmm. so that's a good point, Paul. Some things that I've thought about when I looked at this one is: Do you reward working smart in your environment, in your plant, company, or do you reward working busy? A lot of people have a tendency to work hard, not smart, because they're rewarded for, for working hard. To make a transition, you have to start rewarding people who work smart, using the tools and the technology. Because I remember when I was on my tools many years ago, walk fast, look worried. That was the thing. As long as you look like you were busy, <laughs> you've got stuff to happen. Yep. Now it's it's back up. Take don't do that. Look at the technology. Look at your tools. Use your tools and work smarter. And that's what we need to. When you're using technology, you need to steal. I, I completely agree with Robert there, and and there is a tendency to people to fill up their day with that working harder rather than smarter, uh, and then this ties back to the point to the destination. If if you set that correctly, and then look at what people are doing um, when you introduce these new tools, and look at the tasks that they are, are probably doing nine times out of ten that are, are not valuable. You know that uh, can be uh, put to the side and replaced with uh, whatever task that the digital tool is helping them work smarter. And and that's definitely you know it's it's, it's difficult to convince some people because again you know they're, they're thinking well if I do this and I don't do this I'm not going to be valuable. You know because at the moment I'm busy so I must be valuable. Yeah, I think it's a self-image thing. I mean everybody I think can relate yeah. to the fact that when you go home at night having solved several problems, you walk just a little bit taller as you walk into the house, you feel like you made yep. a difference today. So I think it's a self-image, so we need to help people understand that they can add value in in different ways and you're no longer valued for lifting heavy weights, we've got a crane that does that now, so mm -hmm. where, where, where's your unique value? And I think, you, you, you know, even even at, at lower levels in an organization, there are, there are unique components to everybody's value add. So we need to strip away the non-value add activities like administration, administrative roles, for example, or administrative functions within a higher value. So um, yeah, it's about creating a new self-worth, I think. Mm -hmm. That's, so this is a great point here from all you guys. So I've heard a lot of emotional things. So I've heard of a lot of how I'm valued, stay bit, you know, pretend like you're looking busy, it'll make you feel important. Um, there's there's also some more some more tactical things that go along with that. So shrink the change is something smarter, right? It's just yeah. something smaller. So a lot of people they just get overwhelmed by this big change that is coming. When if you really break it down for them into its simplest form and start small with them, it makes it a little bit easier. Andy, I think you brought up point to the destination earlier, which is if you kind of understand um, where we're going, it will it will you know help attenuate you a little bit better to the kind of bumps in the road along the way, which kind of loops into what Paul was saying earlier, where Paul was saying is yeah, there's going to be some people during these efforts who are actually slowed down, and that slow down is legitimate, but that person's slowdown is making everybody else able to work faster. 
So sometimes you got to be the team player to act, to actually do that. So, and then the other thing is is tweak the environment. So if somebody's saying they're too busy, it may just be that they're prioritizing something that they shouldn't over this. Like that's a very real thing that I think we're kind of all guilty of sometimes. So I think that's that's kind of the four best techniques to kind of try to handle this this particular one. Closing comments before we go to the next one. Yeah, I, I just uh, you know going back to the uh, the the destination is the uh, the why we're doing this and you know what we're going to be doing this and the others following are the how we're going to do this and and I definitely I agree with shrinking the change to something smaller the, the keeping it simple um, provides a lot better buy-in to people who would be more resistant to change rather than changing wholesale what they're doing from what makes them comfortable so you know if you can break it down and certainly we've had this experience with uh, electronic permitting Rather than change all our permitting over from paper to electronic in one go, you know we've taken you know steps of changing different permits over time, letting people get used to the change, see, and they get to see what the value is, um, and then the next step goes a lot easier, um, and they and they get to see that destination coming towards them. Yes, I wanted to kind of expand. I think it was Andy. You said a little. You said earlier that. Mm -hmm. There are people who feel threatened sometimes by some of those new technology coming in. So I kind of agree with what Paul was saying earlier is that all of these all of these people have kind of their unique skills for kind of like why we love them, right? So every person who's on one of your teams, they do something which is the reason why you love them at, at their job. And a lot of technology is coming in to not steal that person's job or to take it away from them. It's to take away the parts that honestly a computer should be doing or somebody else should be doing. It's not part of that person's unique unique skill, which I think we all have parts of our jobs that are that way where we're kind of doing this manual remedial task that we're like, uh, you know, anybody could be doing a computer doing this, could be doing this. So what it is is really just creating that opportunity for them to be doing more of the thing that they're really great at, as opposed to doing some of this stuff that, you know, anybody could do or a computer could do. Uh, I did see that we got a comment here, which I want to kind of ask the panel about, see if they have any experience with, is the question is, some parts of my leadership do not understand what to do with data, and there's no buy-in. So does anybody have any uh, examples of that? or how they've encountered a situation like that? I think, I think you, you know, there's, there's a number of technologies in the digitalization space which are all about data. And, and sadly, one of the traps that you can fall into is collecting lots of data because you can. Uh, I think that the issue here is, well, what was the question? For those of you that are familiar with Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the answer is 42, right? But, <laughs> you know, what was the question, right? So I think leadership need to be looking at, you know, what are our, what's the questions? And that could be really tactical. That could be, let's just get a better handle on our time on tools. On the, on the other hand, it could be, how do we, you know, reduce costs by 33% in, in a new world where macroeconomic influences are changing our business. No shortage of that, according to the pre-roll. <coughs> right. So I think it's what, what's the question. You also need to um, make sure that you've got the resources to look at the data. I mean, if there's one thing computers are good at is creating lots of data, right, right. and our instrumentation, and IoT, and all that, right? But what's the question and who's going to ask it, And you know? Um, so I, I think starting with the question is always, always a good one. And I would, I would add to that that leadership need to get it. And by get it, I mean really understand it, not just be able to uh, use all the big words at board meetings, right? Um, and you don't get it by, you know, lying awake at night in bed. You get it by talking to other people mm -hmm. for hours. I mean, not minutes. 
hours and, and, and getting that collective experience and then you start having the eureka moments around you know what this means in terms of change and then that then will be a catalyst for identifying specific uh, exam questions about what the data should be shown us or areas where we think we can quantifiably improve our business so if you're a leader out there you need to think do I know the words or do I get it and and I would say the difference is just spending the time it's like going mm. to the gym right you can't go once for 20 minutes you know mm. yeah, I think this I one can... relates to point to the destination um, I think there's a a lot of technology stuff that companies have done um, I'm probably guilty of this in places too, just because it's really cool. But if it doesn't actually move the needle at all, or doesn't actually help you achieve the goal you're trying to, then it's kind of for not, right? So I think here is if there's parts of your leadership that don't understand what to do with the data, I think there is something, there's something there for you to point to that destination to say, this is what the data is allowing us to do. This is what the data is telling us we should do. Here's examples of decisions I've made based off of this data or decisions that we should consider making. So I would say there it's either point, it's probably point to the destination because this is probably ambiguous for those people mm -hmm. and they don't understand necessarily what it means. So if you can kind of spell it out a little bit more concretely and specifically and say what the de destination that that data can take you is, then maybe a little bit more successful mm -hmm. with that. Right. Hey, Daniel, we just went through at Delic, we just went through adding some BI data and doing some analytics. When we first started out in capturing that data, we found out that to get management to listen and to share with management and as leaders, the data had to drive action. So everything we brought in and we put analytics around, we backed up and said, will this drive an action? Will this drive my leadership to do something if they see this? Not just put data out for data's sake. So when you want to improve that one for that question is, put information, do analytics around it that drive your management and it drives an action. It says, we have to do this. Here is what we've discovered. Here is what you need to change, and it should drive actions. Yeah, that's a good one, Robert. The other mm. thing I would think about is in the digital world, all this data is free. Right? In, in the digital world, you don't decide to once a year have a time on tool study, or every two years bring in a consultant to tell you what you already know. Mm -hmm. right? the, the data that you're collecting and exposing is a byproduct of using digital technology. So, um, you know, that in itself uh, could bring information overload, but you got to stop thinking about research being something you, you, you do, you know, when you're not getting something else to do, right? The, the data that's surfaced is a byproduct of every activity every day, right? So I would, I would kind of, you know, rephrase it a little bit from what Robert was saying there as, as a leader. You know, I would expect to be challenging, um, you know, my team to look at the data to tell me where we are doing well, where we're not doing well, and what actions that should drive. Uh, if your leaders aren't doing that, then really your driver on the elephant is back to front. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, that that would add on to what I was saying about mm. what's the question. I, th I think you're right. I think there is... Yeah. There is there's answers in the data that you don't necessarily see without yeah. taking the time to look at what we've got and you know look for patterns, look for trend, mm -hmm. look for you know look for questions in the data. Why is this that? I didn't. Mm -hmm. well, that's a surprise to me. Or or even you're just verifying hunches. Like I mm -hmm. always felt this, but never had the data. Yeah. And, and to Robert's point, well, now that you know it, rather than just feel it, what are you going to do about it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Another good question just came in before we move on to the next topic. So what methods have you employed to user test or identify areas that could be optimized within a workflow and capture that data that will give you evidence to value to the value of action? I have an example if nobody else has one that you guys think. 
Um, so something uh, something we did is we did this for a turnaround probably three, four years ago now, um, where we had a customer with a change request process. So as things were identified in the field, how those things got pushed from you know the initiation out in the field to the collecting all the data needed to make a decision to the actual decision making process to once it's decided on to then you know actually go through and plan schedule and estimate that item to when it's executed in the field so what we did is we actually tracked through our system we tracked everything from point a all the way to point z and we measured how long it took to go through each one of those points and what we were doing is we were monitoring in real time how long it took for each one of those points so we could identify bottlenecks and there's a lot of bottlenecks that we really quickly identified. And some of them just came from, hey, we're collecting more data than we need in this piece. Or, hey, this person is taking too long to make this decision, so we either need to put more resources here to help this person, or we need to free this person up so they can make those decisions quicker. So it's just an example of if you kind of measure everything from point A to point B in that workflow, you can start to see where kind of your bottlenecks are and identify what those reasons are. So if you can see where the bottlenecks are, then you can start to identify the reasons. Anyone else have a closing comment on that one or do you want to move on to the next one? My only closing comment to that would, one would be if you look at value, <coughs> any, any, any major number that the would be a, a huge financial benefit that you measured in millions. You're never going to find that $5 million under a rock, right? The $5 million is lots of small numbers multiplied together, mm -hmm. right? It's 400 guys times 230 days a year times $67 an hour times 5%, right? That, that, that's a pretty big number. Now, so I think the question here is really talking about the little incremental pieces of the process, the five mm -hmm. minutes the eight people there and the three percent there so don't we go now looking for a ten million dollar number mm -hmm. find it go and look for lots of little numbers that you can multiply together and nobody will argue with right because if i go and say i think we can save ten million dollars over here because it's cool there'll be a long line of people wanting to argue with me yeah and, but nobody's going to argue with you about the average contractor cost is 67 bucks an hour. It's a fact. Nobody's going to argue that there's 365 days in the year, right? And it's those things that, that, that multiply up, not add up, but multiply up to get you to 5 and $10 million. So that's, that's the things that we need to measure to drive that bigger number. I, I definitely uh, agree with what Paul's saying. And I'll, I'll take it a little bit further in that when we've identified our uh, our business KPIs uh, that can identify that small things, then we use the technology to go and verify that data. So as simple as uh, you know, using your SM, uh, SAP and um, other enterprise resource tools to uh, track start times, delays in maintenance or whatever, or even down to the safety side of, it, of how many errors you have in a permit. If you, if you know what the areas are where you can drive that change that you know, gives you savings or makes you safer, then you, know, you can use the technology to go gather that data to verify or to say, hey, no, this is where we need to take action. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think Paul and Andy, you, uh, you absolutely nailed that. For, mm -hmm. for me, uh, when we think about continuous improvement, right, mm -hmm. continuous improvement is very rarely a step change. Continuous improvement is trying to do 1% better every day. Yep. Do 1% better every day. Over time, you're going to look back, and you're not even going to recognize how far you go. Yep. Um, Follow-up question, what system did we use to track that CR process that was actually Mobidio? That was our system that we did that with. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Nobody has anything else to say. So... Using digital tools means I'm doing the same work twice. Has anybody heard this one before? So, uh, yes, uh, and, and I'll, I'll say on this one, um, you have to burn the boat. Um, 
and 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 commit to using the tool. Um, and people have got to understand that uh, you know that the old way of doing it that uh, when, once you've shown them where the destination is and where the value is, um, people will still slide back into bad habits if you allow them to. Um, so you've got you've got to draw a line in the sand, say no, this is it. We're this is how we're going to uh, go forward. You know, uh, expecting that there are some uh, learning curves and and slow down at. Uh, at the beginning, as we've stated before, but you know the the end game to be successful, um, you're going to have to say, I can't do this double work, you know, and, and this paperwork and the way you've done it has to stop. Yeah, uh, I would. Uh, so I'm a big fan of technology, no surprise. Mm -hmm. what, what I would add on to that is that there's a halfway house, which is let's absolutely burn the paper, but if there's an interim digital step where we provide some information in a format that they're used to seeing, mm -hmm. even though we passionately believe that that information is no longer valuable in a digital world, then a sort of digital comfort blanket um, first time out is useful in, in getting people to, to buy into that transition. Mm -hmm. So there's the paper world, there's the dream digital world, and there's something as a stepping stone which is digital you might think makes no sense and adds no value, but if, the, if we need to give the users that view of life during the transition period, mm -hmm. then then uh, that absolutely ticks the box in terms of helping us get in the hearts and minds on board, which is largely what this dialogue's about. Yeah, to me, and you're looking at this and, you know, I'm doing the work twice. Have we truly looked at, we have integrated in what we're wanting them to put into the digital world and making sure what they're doing and have done is integrated in such a format that it's easier for them to use the electronic stuff to use that data or is it easier for them to fall back on their paper and involving them in and saying look show me why your paperwork and doing it the old way is better than this way and in, in making sure we integrate the key points for the end user so we get the data and the technology moves forward. Yeah, I think there's another angle to that, Robert. There's the, you, you're talking about the it's easier angle. There's another one which is just confidence and trust, right? If you're telling me yeah. you're doing it twice, it's because you don't trust the digital way, right? Now, that you can break that down and say, well, why don't you trust it? Don't you trust the technology? Don't you trust the data? Or don't you trust the, your colleagues upstream of you to do their job, which, which provides you with the data that you're now not trusting. So I think there's 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 a it's easier, which inherently goes with familiarity, but there's also a trust issue. And I think in designing, redesigning the process, implementing the technology, uh, I think making sure that people know where that data is coming from, know which humans were responsible for providing that data, and reestablishing the trust in that. Um, is 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 I think that's fifty percent of the issue right there. The other fifty percent, Robert, you're absolutely right. It's just this is clearly easier and faster because I'm familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And the trust to me comes with training. Proper training instills trust. Yep. Uh, I'd build on top of that, Robert. That not only training but practice. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, for for example, like our. Um, our training method, I guess, that we've we've been successful with is number one, you have somebody stand up and do a classroom training with a PowerPoint slide and a deck and say, this is how you do A, B, and C. And then next thing we do is we actually put a device in somebody's hands and say, all right, now this is how you do A, B, and C. And then the f third step of that is to actually say, all right, like, tablets in your hands, you get up at the front of the group, uh, in front of the group, and then you go through A, B, and C. So usually when people know that they're going to be, like, actually kind of tested on, on the third part, we'll do a little research between session two and session three just to make sure that, uh, that they're not going to, that they're not going to look bad in front of, uh, in front of all their peers. Right. When you're using technology and you're going through and you're doing change management, your change management has to include training and practice as part of those mm -hmm. steps. 
So as, as a, an add to that, um, again, a, something that we found successful there is getting one or two folks that are going to be using this uh, these tools primarily uh, in their in their work that are um, seen as uh, role models for the rest of the organization. You, if you get them to buy in the destination and get them with their hands on, you know, with some good training straight away then they'll become mentors to uh, to everyone else and it, and you'll find that uh, people will follow you know when they trust their peer is bought into it a question in the chat are there intrinsically safe digital tablets available during running of a refinery absolutely yes yes there are in fact we've um, just uh, brought in a new um, version of a tablet that is the uh, same size as a, an iPhone and our operators are absolutely loving it. Yeah, so, on running the devices, there's intrins intrinsically safe cases that can be put on mm -hmm. top of iPads or any kind of technology yeah. that you want to use. Absolutely. So I think I think this one um, really lends itself really well to tweak the environment. Because what I've seen in a lot of my experiences, people just they almost use their old pro paper processes almost. Mm -hmm blanket um, either that or it's, it's an identity thing where it's hey I'm a really high performer and this is how I've always done it kind of thing so tweak the environment I saw a customer do this and I thought it was it's kind of funny but it, it worked pretty well so they have a wall this customer had a wall chart that they would track um, kind of their inspections on during a during a turnaround where if you're familiar with the turnaround this is something that you know this is pretty common practice throughout the industry um, so this customer wanted their their inspection group to move to more of a digital wall chart that we had built for them. So the inspections, uh, the inspection lead at that time said that there's not a chance in hell that he is getting rid of his paper copy. So they kind of, him and uh, our corporate sponsor kind of fought back and forth and eventually it was like, okay, if you're not going to get rid of it, that's, that's totally fine. So what he did it is in the room where the paper wall chart was. You put a pull-down projector screen probably four feet in front of that uh, paper wall chart and projected the digital one um, on that screen right in front of the paper mm -hmm. one. So in order, to up, in order to go look at the paper one, you had to walk around the digital one to go mark the one on the paper. And it actually worked because these guys got to the point where, like, it's more work to go around and not look at the digital one than it is to just look at the digital one sitting on the screen. So it's kind of an extreme example of something that somebody did, but it worked. So like, it's, 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 it's kind of a silly example, but tweaking the environment a lot of times can do things like that. And close the thoughts on this one or want to move on? I just I, I just one way of looking at all of this topic is thinking about digital maturity, right? So it's not binary, it's not zero and one. Uh, you know, so you can you can look at digital maturity, and there's at least five levels there. The top level is fully integrated, automated everything. You know, and you know, so what we're talking about here is getting from zero to one or from one to two. So those interim steps <coughs> that are clearly not. <clears throat> clearly not representative of our ultimate vision, but absolutely on the path can can be tactical, can be simple, and get that adoption. So the the, the maturity model in terms of comprehensiveness and integratedness uh, is something you need to think about. Mm -hmm. so certainly, um, <clears throat> what we've seen, and then this going back to you know the question on on the, the gadgets. Is we've been doing operator rounds for years, you know, with a a, a specific uh, handheld, you know, tablet. Um, when we started introducing other tools, they they weren't compatible. So now you've got you know a handheld tablet for ESOMs, and you've got a tablet for um, operating procedures, uh, electronic permits, and stuff like that. The the technology uh, and the uh, the hardware has has really come on so quickly. That again, we're, we're down now to looking at this one cell phone size, which every operator, brand new or you know, experienced, everyone has a cell phone, all on the one um, 
the, you know, the, the one item that allows you know interconnectivity between these different uh, digital tools as well. Um, and it's it's just uh, amazing, you know, how quickly that has has come ahead. That's able to uh, allow the folks out there in the field to to be you know productive. So a lot of these questions that we're addressing at the moment, even the hardware is taking care of it. Um, when we want, you know, our operators saying we want these things. You know, this, this is what's going to make our life easy. We will be able to use these digital tools um, and uh, get rid of the old, you know, the paper and the old way of doing things. Yeah, I, I, I would add to that one thing, Andy. Um, the, the hardware compatibility is definitely, you know, in place these days. I mean, there's no proprietary hardware yeah. out there anymore and no need yeah. to, for people to be carrying two or no. more devices. The other way of looking at it is that if now that we've got, you know, a common hardware environment, mm -hmm. look at the data because the, the, the other track that you can fall into is if you, <clears throat> if you look at that field worker component and you roll out sequential applications to them as you become digital, there's a, there's a risk that you'll end up with a given guy with one piece of hardware but seven different applications on your yeah. phone depending on what he's doing at any point in time. So you mm -hmm. really got to look for opportunities to consolidate the 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 user experience as much as possible mm -hmm. on the on the hardware. And and you do that by integrating data on the back end, not pushing data to the to the device and having the user copying mm -hmm. data around mm -hmm. one of these systems to look at the schedule separately yeah. from the work order number separately for the you know the, the work package, right? So mm -hmm. um the, the consolidated on, uh, hardware thing is a piece of it, but you've got yeah. to look for opportunities to aggregate the data on the back end to make that user experience as seamlessly as possible yeah. for... And I know that's something that you're doing at Delight, Robert, right? You're looking at multiple data sources ending up in a, um, mm -hmm. in a, in a single user experience. You're exactly right. Multiple data sources integrated to a single, a single product. And that's the hardware and everything, the technology you're talking about, is, I think more later on in the slides, that's going to come into play, this topic later on in one of our slides. Okay. Yeah, it is. La last thing I want to say about this one, which is um, something that I've been guilty of in the past, and I'm sure that we've all had managers who have done this uh, for us before, is to come in and like talk to or train a new group of people trying for one of these digitalization efforts and or like, oh, this is going to be so easy, and it's going to be so intuitive, and this will be so easy for you to use. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of times that's just not true. Like, that all tends, depends on the situation you're in. For some people, it's going to be, like, second nature, and they're not even going to have to think about it. But a perfect example for me is I've used Samsung phones, like, my entire life. My wife has an iPhone. She gave me her iPhone last night, and I couldn't even unlock it, even though I knew the password. <laughs> so, like... Intuitive to one person is not necessarily intuitive to somebody else. So I think we need to keep that in mind as you know, as kind of leaders doing some of these things. That uh, even though it's only you know two clicks to do something, it may not be that easy for someone. All right, let's move on to the next one. So how many times have you done my job? So I'll, I'll, I'll speak on this one first because I've, yeah. I've, had, I've had a lot of experience with this one from my side because a lot of times um, I'm coming in trying to, you know, help an organization roll out this new digital product and I get from the guy who's been sitting in the back doing this for 30 years saying, you know, you're trying to come in and change everything. How many times have you done what I've done? So how well do you essentially know what I'm doing? And the answer is always, almost always never. I've never done your job. Mm. But that doesn't mean that you know, I can't necessarily come in and automate some of the easier parts of your mm. job to allow you to do you know, the, the harder parts where you have kind of the unique skill and ability. So this is, this is just a, this is a resistance that, uh, that comes up it comes up quite a bit from somebody from kind of like my side, my side of the coin. 
anyone trying to roll out this this particular thing? I, I think on on the user side, what we found, uh, I think I've, I've already you know alluded to this before, is is we determine um, when we're bringing in these new tools that we found that we have to have a couple people who are going to be the users uh, involved from day one. You know, so they can the, the people who haven't done their job but understand the the software that's coming in still don't know the processes that we you know have within in the facilities and um, and they can be helped by you know pairing up with the uh, um, the, the folks that are going to be using it at the uh, the end of the day and they, they, there's a collaborative effort between the two of them to come together to say hey this is what we have to do to um, to set up the uh, you know, the technology to set up the training. You know, who, who better to know how to train someone is the person who's going to be using it at the end of the day to, uh, rather than someone who doesn't actually do that job coming in and telling you this is what the software can do and everything's going to be fine. So, Daniel, I want to follow up with what you said. When you first start on your technology change, I see this question come up, this thing, how many times have you done my job? It comes up. But it's all part of the old storming Norman performing. If you're late into your digital transformation and you're still having this happen, you didn't properly set up in the beginning, get mm -hmm. through all the storming, let this stuff come out, get out of the way to move into your technological uh, platform. So this comes up, but we should be, it should be in the beginning and we should be able to change the environment, change your attitude, and get past this to become a team that's looking forward on what kind of technology we're doing and how we're capturing data. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think one of you know thinking about my own experience, I was an engineer a long, long time ago, and uh, the reason that I got into en engineering was to invent things. That seemed pretty exciting to me. The reality of the job when I got into engineering, there was a lot of standing in line at the document control office asking for drawings of legacy part numbers to see if you could reuse parts and things, and there was lots of admin to do. Um, at the time, I just accepted that as part of the role. And I think if you look at you know, a modern example, if you look at schedulers, right, there's a lot of data entry. Mm -hmm. that's required before a scheduler can really add the value of looking at you know a couple of different scenarios resource leveling looking at looking at making a difference to a project or you know an outage um, so I think there's a there's there is a there is a tendency for people to accept the boring low value part of their job as being part of their job that they need to do to get to the exciting value added piece. I think if we can help them understand that we can do more of the value add and they no longer need to accept the standing in line or three hours of data entry that they do every day. Uh, but I think by default people just don't, you know, if you've been doing scheduling for 25 years, you don't question the data entry part as being stupid because it's just part of your, your deal, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we just need to help people to understand that they should be <coughs> You, you know what? You know, I know you've been doing it for 25 years, but really, but why? You know, because I think people just accept it, and, and we're, we're looking at the highest levels in an organisation to stop accepting some things. And it, right down at the individual contributor level, we're asking people to stop accepting the status quo. Uh, I think people default to just accepting it because it's what mm -hmm. they've already done, and, and, and never really ask the question: Is that where I really add my value? And is that the bit I really enjoy? Data mm -hmm. entry. So, so that goes back to the, you know, the, the grow the people and point to the destination. If we're not doing that correctly, we're never going to convince those people to, uh, to, to change those habits. It's always going to be, you know, a lot of energy expended to do that. So, yeah, so I, I think an important thing here also is, A, I think all three of you in some form or fashion hit on the team aspect, right? Like everybody mm -hmm. has a different role in the team. The technology on the personal team, whether it's internal to your organization or if it's something that you're bringing in to help, that's that's their part of it. But also, the building the habit of kind of that clear, quick communication, that good feedback when something is missing, so that you can be reorientated in the right direction. Like, I, I think all successful organizations really have that kind of quick 
kind of no emotions tied to it, like feedback loop. That, uh, that, is, that is incorporated to how they execute. So I think that's an important thing to consider too when, when building habits is that feedback loop is, is essential. All right, let's talk about the next one. So I can't find what I'm looking for. So this one kind of relates to, um, there's so much data out there with some of these, um, with, with some of these tools. And you know it can be it can be difficult for somebody to actually dive down into the details to find the thing that they're looking for, or the thing they're looking for isn't right in front of their face, and they don't want to invest in the time to uh, to actually being able to figure it out of how to get there. So this one kind of this one kind of talks about that. And so Daniel, I think this one kind of goes with the, the comment that come in about digital tools greatly speed up uh, acquisition, but it says the visual displays can be clumsy. And I think this is perfect way to talk about that one right there. You have all this data and then we don't know, are we putting this in a pie chart? Are you going to put this in a graph? Is this going to be in a bar chart? Is this strictly data? Uh, is this data going to be used to set up and put alerts around? And you're not even going to look at the data unless you have alerts and stuff set up. So if you're going in and looking, you have to know what you're looking for. The visual displays and how you're going to do, like at Delic, we have the command center. And we have, we're have we bringing all this stuff together and seeing a lot of different things on one big dashboard. You know, And it breaks out into several different components. The alerts, the, the data, and the graphs are very important to help people be able to find what they're looking for. Yeah, so there's one, um, there's one thing for this also, kind of touching on that comment we saw, is you got to be able to set up a system so that somebody can easily be able to see what they need. So a perfect example of that for what we do is like, for example, we have what we call task reports. Well, if you're a turnaround manager, you need to see a task report for how the tasks are progressing or everything in the refinery. But if I'm an execution lead in the crude unit, I only care about the crude units. So, like, don't show me any of the other stuff because I don't care about it. So what we can do in our system is what we have is we show those people day one, first day of, first day of training is, okay, execution lead one in the crew unit. You come into the crew unit, show you how to highlight your units, and we set a favorite for you. And we set that favorite so that every time you log in, you only see the information that pertains to you. So creating that system and being able to think about what is the information people actually care about and map that to the job and the role that they're doing is absolutely essential. Because if you just kind of give somebody the ocean, then it's going to take them a while to figure out what they want, and they're going to get frustrated. Great point, I, think this is all about, I think this is all about design, and it, it, you know, clearly a process that might have taken somebody 15 minutes before to find a piece of data that now takes 25 seconds immediately seems slow at 25 seconds because our expectation of technology and responsiveness mm -hmm. and, and, and Instagram and Facebook is that it all just instant gratification so I think the design of the system needs to be such that there's responsiveness there and it looks at individuals and, and what they're doing. The other thing is to understand there's a difference between, between data and information in a certain role I might be looking for data I might want the part number right but in a, but in a management role I'm looking for Robert's point actionable insights is the buzzword in that mm -hmm. I, I want a color-coded thing that gets me over the problem fast. And if I yeah. want to drill down and if I've got an appetite for drilling down, I can do that. But I just want to get to the peanut pretty, pretty quick. But, it all, but both of those things come down to design. And I think um, <clears throat> if you know your business and the vendor knows your business, then you should, that goes a long way to design yeah. things that are, that are going to keep everybody happy. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, Paul, you're exactly right. And in that design, no matter which view you look at, the information has to be consistent. It can't show somebody a different information 
So when you're doing yep. that, you're doing your design, you're getting the exact same information in a different look that's formatted for the end user. Yeah, there's another component to this. I mean, we had the old lady there looking, couldn't find the information. One of the bigger problems is your boss is getting information faster than you are. Um, um, and, and, and in a digital world where everything's moving at the speed of light, you know, management need to learn to not overreact at the speed of light. Right, you know, where you might not have known of a problem for a whole shift or or whatever, and by the time by the time you were in the meeting, the problem was already fixed. You're now getting, you know, alerts and red things on dashboard mm. instantaneously. So there's a kind of management behaviour that needs to ensure that you you give your team a chance to do what your team does and not be kind of trigger happy on the on the red traffic lights. You know, so um, that's a, a problem from time immemorial. Um, you know, it's just getting worse now that we're allowed to behave bad, badly quicker than we were in the past. Um, and to my mind, that's that's a discipline thing when you you look at the leadership and how they react to uh, to some of those things. So I, I'm I'm fully with Robert as well. You know, setting up the uh, the alerts that allow people then to go and dig down to the data. But you know, even at the speed of light, you have to have time and you have to have good reason um, to react to those. Uh, alerts that you set up from your business critical behaviors. So a really good question just came in. Uh, when it comes to deploying new tools and training the trainer, what relationships do you build to efficiently train trainers and generate a feedback loop to ensure consistency? So I, I, can, I can take this one because I've done a decent amount of this. Um, so Number one with train the trainers is you got to start with why. If the train the trainer, the train that that kind of super user group, that trainer needs to clearly understand what the goal we're trying to accomplish, and then from a, the technology provider side, is there has to be some tra there has to be some transparency and a lot of transparency. So when I do this and my team does this, we train that person from our customers as if they worked for our company. Like we will walk them through the intimate details of everything that they need to know. We will tell them why something was created the way. We'll under we'll have them understand the philosophy of the software, why it was designed the way it is, why we think the way we think. So you're almost kind of bringing that person to your organization. They're almost straddling the line across both. Um, if you have a technology provider who's not willing to do that, I think you're gonna you're gonna struggle in this in this role. And to that point, our, I mean, our super users um, then come back to us, like they're some of our best, our best feedback for ideas that we, we have even to our software. So they, come, they become almost an ingrained part and, you know, they'll talk to you and give you ideas and ask why things are working this way. And then for the consistency part, it's whoever, whoever your spec project or corporate sponsor is who's responsible for doing that needs to take some ownership into that process also. So they need to sit into the training every once in a while. They need to, you know, make sure that the message is getting displayed the right way to the people that super user is training. That's my question. The other thing I would say is is if you get into, you know, partnership is an overused term in my opinion, but if you have a relationship with your vendor that is open and honest then if you feel there are going to be challenges ahead and you know what they are and you know where the bodies are buried and you know where the resistance is going to be, tell the vendor, tell your technology partner because we're going to find out. And it better you tell me today than yeah. me walk, walk into a room full of sharks three months from now, you, you, you know. So if you've got previous experience rolling out any other kind of technology, let us know, you know, where we need to tread carefully, you know, where 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 we need to be, you know, cognizant of the politics or the culture or previous failures, uh, previous successes. Be as open and honest because there's no way we get through this without finding out. So it's better to know in the first week. Yeah, I I definitely you know agree with that, and, and from the you know the. Uh, the user side of it, we've got to make sure that we provide, you know, people that are going to be successful and be on board, you know, with what we're trying to uh, bring in, you know, software-wise or whatever. It's, uh, 
um, that is a collaboration, you know, between you know two two teams. And if you have someone who on their team that is not going to be uh, with the mindset that this is going to be successful, then you know, Paul's right. He's going to find out sooner than later, and uh, then you just wasted a whole bunch of resources, time, and money. So it's, it's incumbent upon you know, us who are bringing that in to, to give you the right people to make that successful. I agree 100%, Andy. Mm. Set them up to be successful. Celebrate the small wins. Yeah. All right, let's, let's look at the next one. I can't trust the data. Uh, I'm sure anyone who's uh, who's done one of these things, one of these digital rollouts before, has experienced this at, at some point in time. Um, so, Daniel, I, I, I want to mention something about this one. I like this one. I don't know in the beginning, and I'll give you a kind of an analogy. There used to be a TomTom -tom, GPS. TomTom, -tom, you used it to tell you how to get to A to B, but it didn't have much data in it. So when I get to this one, I can't trust the data. So when you're doing technology, there's a lack of data missing. It's You can't trust the data. I think we have a lack of data. The more data that came in, and now we're using Google Maps, Waze. It tells you if there's a wreck ahead. Hey, it recommends going out and changing directions and saving 20 minutes. Uh, and there's nobody out there right now that would not trust their GPS. If it recommends them to change a direction, they'll change a direction. But it couldn't. Our technology now, we're just now gaining data. We don't have enough data to put AI to it to help it make it smarter to tell us, hey, there's something going on. You need to make this turn. You need to go this direction. You're going to save one day on your turnaround. The only way to do that, to be able to get to the point you trust the data, is collect more data until you have enough data that you can create AI around it to drive you to a direction and change the environment. Can I, can I you know, twist this a different way? So maybe I can't trust the data, but there's also I don't understand the data. Absolutely. So there's. I've also come across situations where, like, the data is actually wrong. They don't mm -hmm. trust it because it is legitimately wrong. Mm -hmm. So I have a turnaround manager who will go into his, some of his meetings, and he will intentionally present wrong data. And then he is somebody, inevitably in that room, who is responsible for that data will raise their hand and say, hey, that's not right. And it will be like, I know. It's your job to fix it. You own this data set. Right. So, te technology is neutral. Right? It is. Technology is neutral. It has no bias. You put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. Technology is neutral. You have to get good data, and you have to put the correct data in. And whoever's doing your analytics cannot be biased. You know, they can't be optimist. Oh, that data's wrong. I'm going. We'll, we'll catch up because we're behind schedule. It's you got to take the data and prove that it's wrong and don't put out wrong information. But but technology is neutral. It's it it has no bias about the information. There's no optimism. There's no fear around technology. It is neutral. Yeah, and again back to my, one of my earlier points, you you're asking you got to people ask people to understand that they're really trusting other people and a process. The data doesn't just appear from outer space. Right? <coughs> there's there's people in a process upstream of you and, and you know to use your ways analogy, we're, we're, we're trusting a total stranger that's five miles down the road to tell mm -hmm. us a, a policeman or, or an object in the road, right? But you know, why yeah. wouldn't you try to colleague at the next desk that you've been sitting for twenty five years to do his job and put the data in, right? And and you know, trust the process. I mean trust the process is a phrase, right? I can't remember where that one comes from, but, you, but at the end of the day, where it's no different before. Mm -hmm. There's people upstream of you, and there's a process upstream of you that make that data good. Now, fundamentally, I accept also there's lots of systems out there that are full of data that has over time become uh, unclean, right? But, you know, in, in terms of new shiny digital systems, it's a process and people that you're trusting, not the data, right? You know, the data is a byproduct. 
the process and the people upstream of you. So, yeah. so w whether um, a uh, a foreman is saying that uh, he's fifty percent finished or twenty five percent finished. It doesn't really matter whether it's paper or whether it's digital. You, you've got to trust that he's uh, he's putting in the in the correct data. Robert's right. You know, if he doesn't put in the correct data, whether it's a digital tool or the old method, it's you're going to have uh, uh, a data point that's going to lead you to a wrong decision. Well, well, that's a good point. Uh, and I think with digital technology, certainly the sort of use cases that we support, a lot of our te technology takes that subjectivity out of things, mm -hmm. right? Because people are, uh, um, you know, make mistakes, and uh, which is made no worse by digitalization. And people can be optimistic and pessimistic and, and all that. So I think where you can eliminate some of that subjectivity is, is good. But that's not everywhere. You're still going to rely, rely on the professionalism of your, of your colleagues. And the process, yeah. uh, and I, th I think the other thing about digitalization is it, it delivers at the speed of light transparency, which therefore drives accountability. Which, if people hold themselves and others accountable, brings with it trust. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a kind of goes around in a circle, right? What came first, the chicken or the egg? You know. But um, all right, we got we got one last one. Before we, uh, we can shut this down, thank you panelists so far for the great discussion. This last one, so I carry too much. So this is, uh, this is one I've heard a lot of people in the field saying I've got to carry X, Y, and Z, and now you're giving me one more thing to carry. So does anybody have experience with this one? I, I just got to re-emphasize re where we are at the moment. We're now down to... Um, one cell phone size tablet. Um, it's, it's got the cameras, it's got everything that you need um, for data entry, bringing up operating procedures, doing permits. Um, you know, it, it's, I, th I think that uh, this has become less and less of a, uh, an excuse. And definitely we don't want people carrying too much because they, they tend to trip over and hurt themselves. But uh, yeah, I, I think where the, uh, the the hardware technology is going, and if the software technology can you know, be merged together, we're going to be down to that one small cell phone put it in the back pocket. The folks love it. I, I think this is an extension of my design comment, right? I think when we talk about design, we need, we need to not get tar target fixated over dashboards, right? I think the design is the software, the process, the hardware, and the environment, right? Um, because you miss any one of those and something becomes at best not practical and at worst potentially dangerous. I remember mm -hmm. getting my first ever video camera and deciding to video uh, a motorcycle race and in the course of staring at the world through this lens, walked into the middle of the racetrack. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the design extends beyond the technology. Yeah. So this, this one right here, I've, um, I've got a couple of things to say on. So I, I hear this one a lot, even if this is the only thing that they have to, if they have to carry Andy. And my thought with how to kind of overcome this one is, so if you think about it, every single one of our facilities, we have a culture of safety. All of us do. Like, mm -hmm. But let's, I mean, and it's also, it's strong at every site I've been to. Every single customer I've been to has a strong safety culture. Well, how did that safety culture get built? All right? Did it, did it happen overnight? Did we just decide, hey, uh, all of a sudden we care about safety now? No, it, it was developed over time and over lots of years by saying that, hey, this is important. So this part of kind of digitalization, I always try to coach customers to link this to their safety, like link this to their safety culture, create that action trigger, grow, grow that habit by saying that, hey, part of your, the safety culture is to protect yourself and your team, but also these digitalization efforts, collecting this data that you need to, you know, following this checklist, this digital checklist, for example, like those things can be tied to safety, they can be tied to teamwork, they can be tied to somebody's identity. So I kind of yearn for a world where somebody's device they take in the field to go do their jobs is linked to them as much as their safety glasses are. Mm -hmm. Now they serve different 
they serve different functions, but they, you know, they, they are equally as important. All right, so I'm getting the, I'm getting the red light saying we got to wrap this up. So just want to say um, thanks, uh, thanks presenters. Um, this was this was a lot of fun. So everyone here, please join me and thanks to our, thank our speakers for our session presentation and for all the hard work they put in the last couple of months. Um, as a reminder, this session session is recorded and will be available on demand on this platform until November 1st. Uh, we hope you found this presentation full of value and uh, hopefully some fun. Uh, please take a few moments to complete a short session survey. Uh, to access the survey, point your camera phone at the code in chat. And uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. We really appreciate it. Have a good one. Thanks, Daniel. Been a great time. Thanks, thank Daniel, you. for moderating. Thank you. Bye-bye now.